27, 2022 City Council meeting. Thank you for joining us in this hybrid meeting format. Anyone wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by following the access instructions listed for this meeting on the city's public webcast and meeting materials web page. Tonight's meeting will include a public forum and three public hearings later in the evening. If you wish to speak during the public forum or public hearings and haven't already done so, please fill out a request to speak form available on our public webcast and meeting materials web page. For those in person, printed forms are also available at the entrance to the room. We'll accept request to speak forms until 535. Those requests to speak forms will be used to generate the random order of speakers and correctly enter speakers' names into the public record. For those joining the meeting by phone that wish to provide <coughs> testimony and are unable to complete the request to, mm, request to speak form online, press star nine when the form or hearing is announced and the last three digits of your phone number will be added to the speaker's queue. Please note that the public forum speakers will have two and a half minutes to speak and the public forum will be limited to 90 minutes total. Public hearing speakers will have three minutes to speak only regarding the topic that is the subject of the hearing. And as a reminder, the council's meeting rules of conduct include no flags, signs, loud or disruptive language, noise or conduct that obstructs the business of the council. Please keep the room quiet and respectful for all speakers. And you are always welcome to wave your hands in support, in silent support. Additionally, we're mindful of the transmission of COVID in our community and encourage those who are ill or who have had close contact with others who are ill to join our meetings remotely rather than in person. We also encourage attendees to spread out within the meeting space to allow six feet of distance from others and wear a mask if you would be comfortable doing so. And we have some available in the back of the room if you need one. And finally, oops, if there is testimony you are not able to provide or wish to get to us in a different manner, please feel free to contact us individually or together via email or voicemail. And now I'll open this meeting with a formal land acknowledgement. Since time immemorial, the Kalapuya people have been the indigenous stewards to our region, building dynamic communities, maintaining balance with wildlife and enacting sustainable land practices. Today's land acknowledgement is a way of resisting the erasure of indigenous histories and of honoring native communities by inviting truth and reconciliation. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. As we consider the impacts of colonization, we also acknowledge the strength and resiliency of displaced indigenous people. The city of Eugene is built within the traditional homelands known as Kalapuya Ilahi. Kalapuya descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. They continue to make contributions in our communities here and across the lands. We express our respect for the inherent political sovereignty of all federally recognized tribal nations and indigenous people who live in the state of Oregon and across the nation. So, uh, Today is one of those uh, public forum days and public uh, meeting days in which we actually say the Pledge of Allegiance. And today we are a week ahead of honoring the 4th of July. And so in, uh, in, in recognition of that, I'd like to welcome some very special guests from the League of Women Voters of La Lane County who will read the Bill of Rights and lead us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I would like to welcome Charles C. Kaler, president of the League of Women Voters of Lane County and those who join you. Good evening, mayor and counselors. As the mayor said, I'm Charles C. Kaler, president of the League of Women Voters of Lane County. Tonight, we're honored to present the Bill of Rights in anticipation of the celebration of our nation's independence on July 4th. First, a word about the League. In 1920, after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote, 
The League of Women Voters was founded. Our local league was founded in 1939. And since then, we have been working to create a more perfect democracy. We do this as a nonpartisan political organization, encouraging the informed and active participation in government, working to increase understanding of majority of major public policy issues and influencing public policy through education and advocacy. The constitution begins with the words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish the constitution for the United States of America. There follows the constitution ratified September 17th in 1787. By December 15th of 1791, it was felt further definition and clarification were needed for, and the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights were ratified. Here to read the Bill of Rights are leaguers Charles Crawford, Leah Murray and Veronica Walton who will also lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Charles Crawford. I'm reading the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. And the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describe, describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Leah Murray. I shall be reading the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. The Fifth Amendment, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Incept of cases of in rising on the land or naval forces or in the militia in which actual service of time and more or public danger, nor shall any person be subject of the same offense twice to be put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall they be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself or herself, nor shall be deprived of life liberty or property without the due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and be informed of the nature and the cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process of obtaining the witnesses in his favor, and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Veronica Walton, and I will read the seventh to the tenth. The Seventh Amendment says, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. And the Eighth, 
excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. The Ninth Amendment, the enumerations in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And the Tenth Amendment reads, the powers not delegated to the United States by the constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I mm, pledge allegiance okay, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much for joining us and for reminding us by reading the Bill of Rights and educating us a little bit about the League of Women Voters. We are appreciative of the work that you do and grateful to you for joining us tonight and leading us in the pledge. Thank you all very, very much. It feels, as I said to you at the beginning, it feels even more important this week than, than many weeks that we remind ourselves of of our, our, our rights, our civil rights and our legal rights. With that, we are ready for the first item of business, um, committee reports and items of interest. So do I have counselors, Councilor Sarant? Uh, take it away. <clears throat> so speaking of our rights, uh, I like so many thousands of people uh, am still grappling with the fact that today Americans are less free than we were before the announcement Friday morning that the Supreme Court had decided to overturn Roe versus Wade and declare that the right to abortion is not a constitutional right. I have a lot I could say about this horrible decision and its terrible impacts on the lives of millions of people. And I will likely do so over the coming months. But today I am still too shocked and upset to offer a coherent message. Grief and rage are competing within me, keeping me from being able to offer a meaningful response. But I can say that I know that I stand with thousands of Americans in refusing to go quietly into the dark ages that this decision points us to. I will offer again a tangible way people can help and do something for people in need of abortion services. And that is to support Planned Parenthood and the Northwest Abortion Access Fund, www.naaf.org. This fund provides direct financial assistance for people seeking abortion services in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. This is something that those of us with means can do while those of us with political power figure out a path forward back into a modern society where pregnant people are not subject to forced pregnancy by their government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, words, Councilor Syrad. I think it's, uh... It's a reminder to us that we have to keep fighting for our rights. And this is another, this is another stage in that, um, in that work ahead. So thank you very much. If there are no other, I'm not seeing any other counselors with comments. So I believe we're ready for items of interest. I consent calendar, <clears throat> excuse me. I move to approve the items on consent calendar one. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, yes. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. And let's see. Uh, we're good. We're ready for the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city related issues, except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official. And I will turn to staff to see if you can are able to share the list and total number of speakers that signed up to speak at the public forum. Those who signed up by 735, there they are up on the screen. And then I will 
turn to Sarah to announce the first speakers. And I'll just, let's see, what is the total number? 31, okay. So just a reminder to folks um, that we have 90 minutes. And uh, so if you use, we'll probably get through 31 speakers, but if you don't need to use the full time, we have pretty much assurance that everyone will get their moment to speak. Okay, with that, I turn it over to Sarah. Okay. I will announce two speakers' names at a time. If you are providing testimony via Zoom, when it is your turn, we will announce your name and promote you to panelist status, and you can unmute and turn your computer your camera if you wish. If you are announced as the next speaker and physically in the room, please move to the seat in the front row designated for the next speaker. When it is your turn, you may come to the podium. When you are called to speak, please state your name clearly and for Eugene residents, your ward or neighborhood, if known, before beginning your comments. You will have two and a half minutes to speak. If you're watching the meeting, the timer should be visible. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light indicates the end of the two and a half minutes. For those of you who have connected to the meeting via phone and don't have the benefit of seeing the timer, please be aware that your microphone will be muted at the two and a half minute mark. Please note that the screen sharing or displaying information on the screen is not allowed and any misuse of the platform or violation of the council's code of conduct will result in immediate termination of speaking privileges. Our first speaker will be Maria G, followed by Sam Tyler. It'll be just one moment as I move Maria over to as a panelist. Maria, please unmute. <clears throat> All right, I'm unmuted. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Maria and I work and live in Ward 4. Um, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the grief and fear and exhaustion that the majority of us are feeling right now. Um, among other things, there is still a pandemic going on. Disabled and immunocompromised people are trapped at home while many in the public refuse to do so much as wear a mask indoors to help protect them. Trans people's rights are being obliterated. Unhoused people are being kicked out of their spaces with no place to go. Black, Indigenous, Asian, and Jewish people are being targeted for assault and murder. Housing, gas, childcare, and healthcare are completely out of control. And fascists are seizing power throughout the government. Uh, so on Friday, even though we knew it was coming, when the Supreme Court declared that millions more people had lost their right to bodily autonomy, people all over the country went out to protest, including here. And the Eugene Police Department treated those angry and scared about the loss of civil rights as enemies. They called in the Springfield Police for backup, they dogpiled protesters, an officer jabbed a medic in the sternum with a baton, they launched a weapon at somebody already on the ground, and they arrested 10 people who care about this community. If the Republicans gain control over the federal government, they will impose a nationwide abortion ban, and the protections that Oregon currently has will disappear. And the police department that you all seem to think so highly of will not hesitate to enforce that ban. They will brutalize pregnant people, they will arrest abortion providers. They will harass people until they snitch on their family and friends like we have seen happen in other places. So before we get to that point, start centering and addressing the needs of the most vulnerable in our community and don't give the police department one more cent. We can't wait. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you, Maria. Next is Sam Tyler. Thomas Newman. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sam. Go Thank ahead. You. Mayor Venice, City Council, and City Manager Mendery. Thank you for providing this opportunity for testimony. Uh, my name is Sam Tyler, and I'm a resident of Ward 4 while attending the U of O. Earlier today, I was thinking about the cycle of extreme heat forcing air conditioners into overdrive of emissions that contribute to making our planet warmer. This cycle happens every summer. And with that in mind, I respectfully ask the city council to make a change in the cycle. This can be done by not allowing Northwest Natural to continue to delay climate action and by passing electrification legislation that will reduce emissions and the cost of cooling caused by this extreme heat. 
At the upcoming electrification work session, I asked the, the council to direct staff to draft an ordinance to ma mandate that all new buildings in Eugene be completely electric starting January 1st, 2023. I respectfully call for the ordinance to be presented to council so that it is ready for vote by the September 26th city council meeting. Uh, as for businesses such as breweries that will have a, that have uh, applications that require gas and cannot feasibly be electrified, an infeasibility, infeasibility waiver similar to that adopted by Sacramento and several other towns in California can be developed to address exceptional instances that would necessitate businesses to construct new buildings with gas hookups. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Sam. Next is Thomas Newman, followed by Dennis Reynolds. I am so disappointed in Eugene's leaders in not seeing the positive impacts in middle housing and in the benefits of a more dense, compact city that would utilize existing infrastructure for a greater amount of people. If the Planning Commission tells you that existing infrastructure can handle additional capacity, then believe them. Mass transportation is more important than electric cars. I find it idiotic that a large amount of public transport it was less important than electric cars. I find it idiotic that um, the electric cars, um, also electric cars still wear our roads like normal gas cars and still encourage unwalkable infrastructure that is slowly killing us in our long commute to work to work. Please stop listening to an old generation that only cares about their homes as an expensive real estate investment and not about our housing affordability crisis that young people face. Also, please stop in the disbelief that people in general are interested in more dense, taller buildings, especially our younger generation. I'm also sick of listening to baby boomers and older people tell you about the lack of green space with minimal middle housing. That's what parks are for. I'm worried about, if you are worried about green space, maybe Eugene should have a code amendment that allows houses with rooftop gardens. Eugene should also be investing in EMX further by building more routes and converting EMX buses fully to electric and investing in carless streets designated for active transportation. Lastly, I want to support Eugene for being a good role model for other cities by banning natural gas installation in all buildings. We also need to invest in our education system until every high school is a 10 out of 10 high school on the betterschools.org rating system. Another thing I think we should do is encourage unions and reward businesses that are unionized and give them some sort of tax incentives. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Next is Dennis Reynolds, followed by Richard Locke. Dennis, go ahead. Okay. Um, Mayor Venice, members of the council. My name is Dennis Reynolds. I live in Ward 3, and I'm proud to serve as a member of your Sustainability Commission. But tonight I'm here to offer testimony as a member of the Eugene Springfield Interfaith Earth Keepers and as an affiliated community minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene. Um, often the debate about climate legislation or action that you will, can take at a municipal level is between short-term economic issues and the well-being of all. And you will hear many um, testimonies tonight um, about the various issues that are lifted up. I invite you tonight to bring um, a third factor into your decision making. In addition to, to attending to science and economics, I'm encouraging you to listen to the voice within that calls you to live out your highest values and move promptly forward towards electrification, first stopping expansion of gas infrastructure, and then moving on towards equitable electrification for all. Last fall, in a joint statement, Pope Francis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Churches spoke out about climate change. They said, as leaders of our churches, we call on everyone, whatever their beliefs or worldview, to endeavor to listen to the cry of the earth and of the people are poor, to examine their behavior and pledge meaningful sacrifice for the sake of the earth. They continue, all of us, whoever we are, um, can play a part in changing our collective response to the unprecedented threat of climate change and environmental degradation. The Buddhist teacher, David Loy, says the kind of consumer society we take for granted is so toxic to the environment and continuing business as usual is a grave 
threat to our survival. And the indigenous writer and teacher Robin Wall Kimmer acknowledges the reality of our current market system is that the very earth is being destroyed to fuel injustice. What is the alternative, she asks and answers. I believe the answer is a vision of the economy of the commons, wherein fundamental resources fundamental to our well-being, like water and land and forests, and I'm add, I'd add clean air, are commonly held rather than commodified. It's not just changes in policy, she continues, that we need, but also changes to the heart. Scarcity and... Thank you, Dennis. Your time has concluded. Next is Richard Locke, followed by Carolyn Partridge. Council and staff, my name is Richard Locke. I'm a business owner, founder of the Eugene Business Alliance, and also the president of that. I'd like to uh, start out by just uh, singing a little praise for our no good police that I heard about. I would like to praise Chief Skinner for the good job stopping our friends dressed in black from duplicating the 2020 riot property destruction in Eugene last Friday night. It shows that we've learned that if you let it start, they will continue until they don't want to do it anymore. It was very refreshing to see a swift action by our local law enforcement agency working together to stop it immediately. I was not surprised when there was no reported arrests and incidents Saturday. Now I'd like to talk about what I see as selective parking enforcement. I've been reporting on RV camping to you folks for over a year now and find that our parking enforcement is selective. My report log shows that many are moved, but some escape the movement process. Why is that? My observation are that staff parking management, not enforcement officers, are overlooking these RVs for some reason. I don't know why. Why are most being moved and a few not. I, I communicate with other businesses that have these selected campers in front of their businesses. And they are filing reports also and finding no action. So we have multiple reports filed from different businesses throughout the area about the same RV, yet they are still there. Most of these folks are highly disrespectful to uh, business owners and dumping their wastewater on our streets. When are we going to hold the serial, willful violators accountable? I have one request of staff, and that would be that the IT provide a comment box in the, the report. Thank you, Richard. Your time has concluded. Next will be Carolyn Partridge, followed by Adrian Feynman. Carolyn, please unmute and go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Venice, Councilors and City Manager Maderi. My name is Carolyn Partridge and I live in Ward 2. In Ward two. It has been disheartening to watch human beings trying to face up to climate change. Scientists brought, us, brought it to our attention over 50 years ago when it would have been a much easier situation to manage. Now it's an existential crisis that is already having tragic impacts worldwide and it's getting worse. What I observe is that the powers that be are bungling the problem more than they are solving the problem. Sometimes it's ineptitude or lack of vision Sometimes it's doubts about the magnitude and urgency of the problem. Sometimes it's the belief that no one else is doing anything, so why should we? But frequently, the bungling is actually intentional because vested interests have powerful seats at the table and are profiting from the status quo. It's worth noting that frontline communities and the young are not at the table at all. I see some leadership and mostly good intent on the part of this council. 
but not much substantive progress, substantive progress has been made since the Climate Recovery Ordinance was passed in 2016. At hand now is the chance to pass an ordinance requiring that all new construction be 100% electric and to craft infeasibility waivers for businesses that absolutely need them. This would be a reasonable and effective policy. I've spoken to you many times with the same basic message. So this time I'm going to, <laughs> going to add a football analogy. We are barely out of our own end zone and it's very late in the fourth quarter. We need a first down, which this ordinance would accomplish. We cannot afford to fumble, punt, or count on a Hail Mary pass. We need to act now. Please advance this ordinance for passage in September. Thank you for listening and thank you in advance for taking action. Thank you, Carolyn. Next is Adrian Feynman, followed by Todd Boyle. Adrian, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Adrian Feynman and I'm a designer with Cedar Stone Design Build. Our website is cedarstonedb.com. We were selected by the city of Eugene for their new ADU library project. We were selected almost a year ago and we're only one of three today that have been approved. This goes to show the difficulty of what was being asked of these designers. We had to develop drawings all the way to permit with engineering without any compensation. Our design is one of the only ones using an innovative approach to sustainable dwelling. Uh, we came from Canada where we worked under world-renowned Indigenous architect Douglas Cardinal developing housing for the North. The benefits uh, of what we developed for remote harsh climates are a benefit to any homeowner. So when we returned to Eugene, we decided to specialize in industry-leading sustainable single-family dwellings. The homes we designed for the north had to be durable, energy efficient, carbon sequestering, since we were design designing for indigenous communities who were committed to a low carbon footprint. The buildings also needed to be fire safe, healthy, for no chance for mold, no off gassing. They had to be very low maintenance and a very quick build. They had to be beautiful and nurturing. All these things are desirable for any homeowner from both an environmental perspective and long-term financial savings. To build a home that performs better on every metric and saves money long into the future costs more upfront than your typical build. This is why we use timber panel construction because you can harness the principles of prefabrication and find savings in labor and installation. Our houses are estimated at $375 per square foot. Comparable to luxury quality homes but pricier than typical. Then you add SEC charges, utility hookups, permit fees, architectural engineering services. This is why we jumped at the opportunity to be included in the city's ADU library to save people the cost of permit, architecture, and engineering. We're proud to have a timber panel ADU ready to build. I'm speaking today to let the public know the service we're offering and to let the city know that we've spent years of our lives gaining the experience to speak to the costs of building sustainably. We're asking the city to continue to consider how to financially support those of us taking the risk to lead a paradigm shift in sustainable dwellings when the benefits to our community are undeniable. Again, my name is Adrian. I'm with Cedar Stone Design and Build. Our website is cedarstonedb.com. You can learn more about our pre-approved ADU or speak with us about a custom project. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Adrian. Next is Todd Boyle, followed by David Eigel. Council and fellow citizens and everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Boyle. I'm in Ward 2, in Mr. Keating's uh, ward, and uh, I'm a veteran of two campaigns, the Campaign for the Liberation of ADUs and Middle Housing. So I came here to talk about, I'm also the host of the First Quartile um, Housing Group. It's a Facebook group for discuss, discussion and anal analysis of um, the low-income housing crisis, where there is a gap between the homeless at the bottom and about 50 percentile of incomes above that who aren't so, are gonna be so, served by either the public sector or the private sector because the numbers are just simply too, too large. So <clears throat> my problem is that we need facts about the size of the problem and exactly what's the profile of the, uh, the people in the, in the gap who are most in need of, of uh, help. So we know that there's thousands of people who are um, being displaced from Eugene. Uh, Amer uh, you know, American Community Surveys is the Census Bureau, and they do annual updates of the, you know, um, demographic information for all cities, including Eugene. And they say that uh, 15,000 people who are here are new residents. And um, that's a lot of people 
coming to town. And we know that about 1,700 people a year is our net growth in our population. So that means something like, what, do the math, 13,000 people are leaving every year. So that's a lot of people. You could say they're being displaced. But, uh, you know, the problem is that we have the students mixed in there. And so what I'm really going to ask for is that this, the city take action to obtain information from ACS that's available uh, and that they will sell. You have to pay a few thousand dollars to get the types of breakdowns that we need. We need cross-sectional data. For example, you know, the, the table B19081, it says that the mean household income of quintiles. So we're going to look at the bottom quintile. That's 20%. That'll be like 36,000 people, and their average household income is $10,000, 10,700, okay? But the trouble is we have 30,000 college and university students, and so we need the breakdown. We need the breakdown. So this is a three-dimensional breakdown, right? Income by decile or quintile filtered to students and non-students. We need that breakdown. Otherwise, how can we make you know, judgments about what's you know, happening in Eugene? We also need breakdowns of the costs. I'm already running out of time here. Housing costs by decile and by renter by versus owners, student and non-student. So in, also the map excludes the uh, unincorporated areas. So we're not even getting the statistic, any statistics on the actual. Thank you, Todd. Your time has concluded. Next will be David Eigel, followed by Betsy Hitz. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is David Eigel. Uh, I'm in Emily Semple's ward. I'm here today to ask the council to formally honor a truly great son of Eugene, the late Professor Frederick Dunn. Professor Dunn was a wonderful man. At the age of 19, he graduated as his class valedictorian at the UVO and then left for Harvard to continue his education. Dunn was the proud descendant of one of the most heroic and courageous abolitionist families in the US. His grandparents moved from Illinois to Bleeding, Kansas, where for years they dedicated and risked their lives to free slaves. He spoke with pride in the press of his ancestors and how he played the role of Little Harry, the black slave child in an 1875 Eugene production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Dunn was not active with the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan Fraternal Order, Eugene Chapter, let alone its leader. He gave a lifetime of love and service to the people of Oregon and was widely beloved in return. In addition to Greg Evans having helped Michael Schill spread his misinformation about Professor Dunn in our community, we now have Jennifer Ye at the Lane County History Museum providing a forum to the Oregon Black Pioneers cheap racially and religiously bigoted smear piece directed at many Eugenians, including Professor Dunn. For example, Eugene Protestant ministers in the 1920s did not march about yelling racist, hateful speech. Far from it. These lies are upsetting to the families of those victimized by these falsehoods. I will be providing additional information to the council and anyone who would like to receive free copies may email me at drigl at comcast.net. That's drigl at comcast.net. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next is Betsy Hitz, followed by Ellen Firstner. Good evening, Mayor Venice, City Council, and Manager Maderi. Thank you for providing this opportunity for testimony. My name is Betsy Hitz. I'm a resident of Ward 1. I am a retired dietitian, an organic gardener, and a grandmother. Over the course of many years, I have educated myself about the unfolding and accelerating climate emergency. I have taken as many steps as I can to reduce my personal carbon footprint and have also been actively advocating for local and state policy changes that will end our reliance on climate damaging fossil fuels. It is a big change, but a very, very necessary one. I am grateful you are advancing important and timely policy to regulate the expansion of fossil gas infrastructure and decarbonize our buildings. We know our federal government is slow to act and the international community even slower. It is up to decision makers in cities where this effort gets started and it's well underway. I'm proud that Eugene is on the forefront in Oregon. Greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings are second only to our emissions from the transportation sector. And with emissions from fossil gas on the rise, this common sense approach to mandate new construction be all electric is right on target. My ask is that you at your July work session direct staff to draft ordinance language 
for adoption of this policy to start January 1, 2023. It is important to move quickly to a public hearing and vote by September 26th council meeting, not only for the sake of reducing local emissions as soon as possible while protecting our most vulnerable communities, but also to not allow delays or gas industry misinformation that cast doubt on settled science about the environmental and economic benefits that come from electrification. Please don't break up the ordinance into separate parts for residential, commercial, and industrial, but, but rather keep it together, perhaps with a phased adoption, which includes an infeasibility waiver options as other communities have done. Thank you again for your efforts. I am excited to be part of a community that takes its responsibility for a stable climate future seriously. Thanks again. Thank you, Betsy. Next is Ellen Firstner, followed by Ethan Klein. My name is Ellen Firstner, and I live in Marcola, Oregon. I am part of Heart of Marcola, a small group of people and families who do local community service. We also, every week for the past one and a half years, make sandwich for homeless folks in Eugene. Over, that's over 78 weeks. 200 mostly peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and 100 buttered bread each week. That's in one and a half years, 15,600 sandwiches, 7,800 buttered breads, not counting cookies and other snacks bagged in individual portions, plus dog food and cat food. On Friday mornings, I drop these off at breakfast in the park, now on First Street by the skate park. I stay and help serve the hot breakfast made by volunteers and the bag and help with the bag lunches. I have been there on the coldest days. I have been there on the hottest days. I have been there on the wettest days and it is hell. I've seen evictions and sweeps. I've seen, and I have pictures, 10 cops, yes, 10, standing around laughing, four police cars and several city trucks and crew nearby as they made an old man in very bad health pick up his tent and move. He had been asleep and there was absolutely no trash around. It happens all the time. Why, for a good laugh, I guess. I've seen frostbite, unbelievable sores, pain, disabilities, and so much hunger and heartbreaking mental illness. It is just horrible. I stay on Fridays and that's been over a year and a half for me. I've heard arguments only a few times. I have never seen violence there. I've been yelled at two times. What I have seen and heard is a lot of thank yous and we appreciate you. Lots of smiles and respect. And let me tell you, I would much rather spend time talking to these folks than to any of you. I'm only here to tell you how disgusting and evil I find your attitudes to be. You need to solve this problem. Sweeping the problem under the rug doesn't help, but you sweep it under the bridge. You sweep it into the river. Sweep, 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 and hail to the world games. Thank you, Ellen. Next is Ethan Klein, followed by Chuck Arford. Hello, uh, city electeds. Uh, my name is Ethan Klein. I live in Ward 1, and I am here representing the Eugene, Democrat, Eugene Springfield uh, Democratic Socialists of America and uh, Fossil Free Eugene. Uh, I'm here to uh, advocate that uh, Eugene electeds uh, draft an ordinance to uh, mandates that new uh, new homes uh, are electric uh, hookups and uh, no and ban uh, any new methane gas hookups. Uh, speaking as a younger person at, at 30 years old, um, I uh, personally hear the stories of people that much younger than me uh, that are currently faced with environmental depression, environmental anxiety, and um, for me, speaking from the age of 30, hearing the stories of people just five years older than me and um, hearing how bleak uh, their, their outlook is, uh, I think that the city of Eugene can really take a stand and uh, set a model for the rest of the country and, and making some bold actions. And so I strongly believe that uh, you as elected officials uh, should 
do everything possible to actually mandate this ordinance and get the ball rolling on it and stop dragging your feet. New electric gas hookups, no more methane, no more new methane gas. Um, I will be speaking later uh, at the public hearing on the Eugene budget. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Ethan. Next is Charles Ar Arford, followed by Paige Hopkins. Charles, please unmute. Good evening, this is uh, Chuck Arford, Ward 8, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak. I wonder how many of you read the full page ad, excuse me one second here. Sorry. Chuck, you are muted. Please unmute. I wonder how many of you read the full page ad in the recent issue of the Eugene Weekly, written and compiled by Professor Emeritus Al Urquhart, please forgive my pronunciation, who founded the Environmental Studies Program at the U of O. The ad is dense with small print and some difficult to read graphs, and it is grim so grim that I hesitate to talk about it. Yet I feel the 91-year-old Professor Emeritus, a true expert and an elder, deserves to be heard. He and the nonprofit group, Job One for Humanity, maintain that we are perilously close to climate tipping points. That is major changes in the Earth's climate that cannot realistically be reversed, much like a glass of wine tipping over. These tipping points are either 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade temperature increase, which I understand has a 50-50 chance of happening over the next five years, or 425 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. As of June 14th, that number stands at 421.71. So again, we're very close. So close to the point where unstoppable global heating will occur and quote, any realistic or practical control of future global warming to prevent mass extinctions is impossible. According to Professor Urquhart, that mass ex extinction includes half of humanity dying by mid-century. Four billion people dying only 28 years from now. If I live as long as a good professor, I may witness this. I certainly don't want to. More deaths will occur as we put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and every reduction could save lives. We can only try to do the right thing to make a difference. Please, no more fossil fuel infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Next is Paige Hopkins, followed by Kara Parker. Paige, go ahead. Hello, Mayor Venice and City Council. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I am Paige Hopkins, speaking as a resident of Ward 3 and the Climate Justice Organizer for Beyond Toxics. I want to thank you for your work on supporting building electrification and helping transition our community to a clean energy future for all. It is vital for the city council to move forward with policies to, to transition our buildings to clean renewable electricity and mandate for 100% electric new construction. We cannot allow the fossil fuel industry to continue to obstruct and delay smart climate policy like building electrification that will reduce emissions, save people money and improve public health. Passing a strong building electrification policy will set Eugene as a leader and example for other cities throughout the nation to follow. There is also a strong overlap between large GHG emitters and large toxics emitters in our community. With data pulled from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, we have found that 19 of the top or 15 of the top 19 industrial GHG emitters are also on the list of Eugene's highest toxics emitters. These industrial emitters are bad on both accounts. As the city prepares to regulate GHG and toxics emissions, it is critical that these facilities be included given their high impacts on both climate pollution and public health. For your upcoming electrification work, work session this July, I ask that you direct staff to draft ordinance language to mandate new buildings in Eugene be all electric starting January 1st, 2023. Please move that the ordinance be, pres be presented to council so it is ready to, for a vote by September 26th city council meeting. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Paige. Next is Kara Parker, followed by Melody DiStefano. Kara, go Thanks. ahead. Hi, my name is Kara Parker. I have a BS in biochemistry from the University of Washington 
I attended ATSU School of Osteopathic Medicine and have a graduate certificate in sustainability from Portland State University. I'll be starting my second year of law school this fall, and I'm currently working as a law clerk at Cascadia Wildlands and living in Eugene in my van. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and have called Oregon my home for the last six years. I remember the day Eagle Creek burned and the ashes of the trees I grew up hiking in fell on my skin. I know that fire is a necessary part of our forest ecosystem, but we have to make changes based on what we have learned to fix our fast shortcomings. For forest health, that is allowing the forest to go through its natural cycles. For energy use, it is stepping away from using fossil fuels and moving towards renewable electricity and energy. As we know, carbon dioxide and methane are major contributors to climate change. Homes and buildings consume more than 43% of all energy in Oregon. Oregon could avoid emitting a significant portion of this if we switch from gas to high efficiency electric appliances instead. Currently, Oregon relies approximately on 25% on natural gas and 27% on coal to create electricity. The reliance on gas has doubled in the last seven years, whereas wind power has decreased. Solar only contributes 1.7%, but Oregon's capacity far exceeds that. Continuing to build gas infrastructure will be more expensive, worse for the environment and climate change and, and, change, and worse for human health and safety. Inevitably aging pipes and infrastructure will perpetually lead to money spent fixing them, as well as methane leaks, which are a potent greenhouse gas. Eugene is in a unique position where it can be a leader in the elimination of fossil fuels. I hope that Eugene as a city will take this step with the urgency the climate and public health, is, health crises call for. I can still see ash from the 2017 Eagle Creek fire in my skylight, and it has been added to by the continuing fires each summer. We need to invest in smarter options, move away from fossil fuel use, and continue to do our part to mitigate climate change. We do not have another option. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kara. Next is Melody Stefano, followed by Eloise Navarro. Melody, go ahead. Hi, Mayor Venice, City Council, and City Manager Madari. Thank you for providing this opportunity for tested testimony. My name is Melody. I'm 18 years old, and I'm a resident in Ward 1. Thank you for your votes. Move forward to motions on transitioning our community to clean electricity last fall. This is a huge step on the way to creating a fossil free Eugene and a more just and sustainable future for our city. That said, we still believe that it is critical for council to move forward with an ordinance by September 26 city council meeting. We cannot continue to be tied down by natural gas infrastructure. It's not healthy for us and it's not healthy for the earth. I work doing environmental conservation and we experienced our first heat wave over this weekend. At work, two of my coworkers ended up vomiting because of the heat exhaustion. All I could think about was that this may be the coldest summer that I will be experiencing for the rest of my life because it's only going to get hotter from here on out. We're in a climate crisis now and now is the time for the city of Eugene to pass concrete policy to decarbonize our buildings. We cannot have any more new gas hookups. It's time to begin working towards retrofitting existing buildings with an emphasis on supporting low income and BIPOC and historically marginalized communities in the transition off of fossil fuels. As such, I ask that at your upcoming electrification work section, session, you direct staff to draft ordinance language to mandate the new electric buildings in Eugene uh, that new buildings in Eugene be all electric starting January 1st, 2023. Please. Thank you. Melody, next is Eloise Navarro, followed by Abigail Gravat. Eloise, please unmute. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi there, my uh, Mayor of Venice, City Council, and City Manager Maderi. Thank you for providing this opportunity for testimony. My name is Eloise Navarro, and I am a resident in Ward 2. I am here today to thank you for your vote to forward the two motions on transitioning our homes and buildings to clean electricity last fall. I'm excited to be a part of a community that values creating a just and sustainable future for all. Now, Council must move forward with an ordinance as quickly as possible. As we approach the hot summer, 
we continue to live through the climate crisis and experience the consequences of fossil fuel driven societies. We have an opportunity to pursue electrification and instead experience the environmental and economic benefits that accompany it. I am the environmental and climate justice coordinator at the Eugene Springfield NAACP. Across the country, indoor air pollution from fracked gas disproportionately impacts low income and communities, low income communities and people of color. Eugene is no different. Our most vulnerable populations have been the first to experience the negative effects of indoor air pollution, including increased rates of asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Fossil fuel infrastructure causes disproportionately negative economic impacts to vulnerable communities as well. Oregon state agencies estimate that energy efficiency improvements such as improved heating, cooling and weatherization in homes can save $113 million per year in utility costs for low income households. Electrification will save lives and help us create a more environmentally and racially just future. I'm asking that at your electrification work session on July 25th, you direct staff uh, to draft ordinance language to mandate that all new buildings in Eugene be constructed using all electric infrastructure starting January 1st of 2023. Please move that the ordinance be presented to council so that it is ready for a vote by September 26th um, at the September 26th city council meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eloise. Next is Abigail Gravat, followed by Kathy Gein. Hello, Mayor of Venice and City Council. My name is Abigail Gravat, and I'm a resident in Ward 2. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to testify, and thank you for your vote to forward the motions on transitioning our community to clean electricity. This is motivating to see and a step in the right direction for our city. We must continue this momentum and to do so, it is imperative for the council to move forward with an ordinance as quickly as possible and not let important climate action be stalled by the deliberate actions of the industry that benefits from our fossil fuel consumption. I'm a leader in the Climate Justice League at the University of Oregon. Our Fossil Free UO campaign has done lots of research on the feasibility of electrification for our campus. This translates to the electrification of our city and the evidence shows that it is possible. Due to the current state of our climate, now is the time for the city of Eugene to pass concrete policy to decarbonize our buildings and not be left behind as others transition. To achieve this, I ask as others have, that at your upcoming electrification work session, that staff are directed to draft ordinance language that would mandate that new buildings in Eugene be all electric starting January 1st, 2023. Please move that the ordinance be presented to council so that it is ready to vote on by September 26, 2022. An infeasibility waiver similar to that adopted by Sacramento, California can be developed to address instances where technologies do not currently allow for this electrification. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Abigail. Next is Kathy Ging, followed by Maddie Reese. Kathy Ging, Ward 2, Spotlight on America, K Dangerous can require 10 times more water to extinguish. One required 10,000 gallons besides spreading talk. Differential look at EVs before taking a complete turn that direction. David Bloom, alcohol can be a gas said, we won't be able to transition 100% to EVs because all grids unable to stand load. Hybrids will be needed, liquid fuels and batteries. Plus, stocks can be turned into gas. I sent email how hemp gas could cost $1.40 a gallon if enough growth gas costs four times less. Next, I was asking, Kathy, your sound yeah. is fading in and out. We're not hearing everything you're saying. Are you still there? Hello? Okay. We can hear you now. Your sound is going in and out. Oh. Your phone, your con connection is cutting in and out. If you're on a phone, we're losing your connection.
Kathy, we're going to come back to you. I'm going to move to Maddie Reese, and we will call on you again. If you would like to exit the meeting and come back in to reaffirm your connection, we will allow you to speak later in the forum. Mayor Venice, City Council, thank you for pro providing this opportunity for testimony. My name is Maddie Reese, and I'm a resident of Ward 1 and a rising second year law student at the University of Oregon. I'm also a law clerk with Cascadia Wildlands, a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization that's a founding member of the Fossil Free Eugene Coalition. Thank you for your vote to forward the two motions on transitioning our homes and buildings to clean electricity. It is critical for council to move forward with an ordinance as quickly as possible because we cannot allow the fossil fuel industry to continue to delay climate action and cast doubt on settled science about the environmental health and economic benefits that come from electrification. I've lived in the West almost my entire life and I've seen the harm that climate change causes here. Unprecedented wildfires have destroyed homes and made it impossible for many people to go outside for weeks at a time. Dramatic heat events kill or continue to kill Oregonians every summer and air pollution causes thousands to suffer respiratory illness. But we can make changes to improve these conditions. According to Washington State's deep decarbonization pathway study, the lowest cost, path cost pathway for achieving 80% carbon reductions economy-wide by 2050 relies on electrifying our buildings. The same is true for Oregon. I ask that at your upcoming work session this July that you direct sta staff to draft ordinance language mandating that new buildings in Eugene be all electric starting January 1st, 2023. Please move that the ordinance be presented to council that is, so that it is ready for a vote by September 26 um, at, your at your next council meeting. It's especially important to stop the expansion of gas now to avoid locking Eugene residents into paying for new gas infrastructure for decades to come, infrastructure that may soon become obsolete. This is another hardship that would be disproportionately borne by households living on lower incomes because these households will be slower to convert to electric due to cost. It is also to remember, important to remember that buildings with an existing gas hookup would be allowed to keep that access to gas under these proposed legal pathways, even if ownership were changed or they un underwent minor renovations. Eugene already has a solid climate action plan. We now need concrete policies that give meaning to this, this plan's words. Electrification will not happen at the speed, scale, or equitable manner required without strategically, strategic policy action and focused leadership today. It's not a matter of if Oregon will transition to 100% renewable energy, but when. It's time for Eugene to lead the way. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Maddie. Kathy Ging, would you like to unmute and try again? Kathy, please unmute. Okay, we will move to Lynn Woodrich, followed by Linda Kelly. Lynn, please unmute. My name's Lynn Woodrich. I'm the active Bethel Community Co-Chair living in Ward 6 with my 93-year-old dad, and I've been a homeowner in the Bethel portion of Ward 8 for over 25 years. ABC has had three evacuation zone park events, mostly in the pouring rain, for zones 15, 9, and 10, and we now have over 100 Bethel residents who filled out our visioning surveys. And we now have 30 residents who've signed up to help with the Bethel planning. We have two more zone park events happening in the sunshine, I hope. This Saturday in Grasshopper Meadows Park for Zone 11, and July 9 in Gilbert Park for Zone 16, where we will be collecting more surveys and more people who want to help with Bethel planning. We'll also be putting the survey onto our webpage after the events conclude. It has been 40 years since Bethel had an area plan and we're asking to be next on the list. We've been neglected for far too long. Zach Mulholland, an ABC board member, sent you all a letter today regarding the biking and pedestrian projects for inclusion in the next road bond. Our Bethel area plan will be including these suggestions when we're given the opportunity to plan our future. It would be appreciated if you would consider these projects as high priorities for the Bethel community for allocation of bond funds. Thank you for scheduling a work session for the public health overlay zone, chronic toxic polluters on July 27th. This tool will be a critical piece in future planning for our area. I'm hoping that you understand the urgency and have come up with a way to move up the area plan for Bethel. The neighbors need to have a voice in the future of Bethel. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Next is Linda Kelly, followed by Fred Mallory. Good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. I presume you can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Good. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Linda Kelly and I live in Ward 1. I want to thank you first for the work to date on an electrification policy. I ask that you move forward with passing an electrification ordinance in September. I want to suggest an opportunity tonight that could help achieve some of our CAP2 goals, enhance our health, and reduce irritation levels in the city. California has recently passed legislation that will make only electric small motor lawn equipment available for sale by 2024. Another hundred cities have decided to stop selling gas leaf blowers. We can create a buyback program for existing gas leaf blowers using offset monies. I know it was $60,000 a few years ago, um, needed to fulfill the CAP2 requirements for lowering our greenhouse gas emissions. This keeps our offset spending local and visible. The two stroke engines used for gas leaf blowers are extremely polluting. One hour of gas powered leaf blowing has been shown to create emissions equal to driving a car or truck between 1500 to 3000 miles. Estimates vary, but they're significant. There, there are many brands of electric leaf blowers available, including well-known brands like DeWalt, Black & Decker. Prices range from between $80 to $362. Online customer ratings are very positive. We could eliminate 600 gas leaf blowers with a $100 rebate per customer for a trade-in on their gas blower. The Master Recycler Program could run the trade-in, keeping costs even lower. After writing up my testimony, I opened up my eWeb newsletter today and see that they are advocating for going electric with lawn care. Please consider this relatively easy carrot approach to furthering our greenhouse gas emission goals. You can then let our community know how your work is enhancing life for us all right here and right now. Thank you for hearing my suggestion. Thank you, Linda. Next is Fred Mallory, followed by Alan Hancock. Hello. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I didn't have anything prepared, but I wanted to, at least to say that uh, as an old guy that uh, retired from eWeb in the energy management field, I think you guys are going the right direction. Thanks. And, and I really congratulate that. Uh, I want to leave a little carrot for uh, charging EVs. I think that hopefully we can allow that in the new uh, plannings you, you have on, coming up. But uh, that's primarily all I wanted to say. Just congratulations. Thank you very much for being the leaders. Next is Alan Hancock, followed by Justin Sandoval. Hi, uh, my name is Alan Hancock and I live in Ward 3. I've uh, been serving on the City of Eugene's Active Transportation Committee for nine years and the Street Repair Review Panel for the last four years. Um, as you know, the city hired a polling firm to gauge voter sentiment under several different bond measure scenarios. And staff provided the Street Repair Review Panel a preview of the results last week. And you'll be receiving a full report at Wednesday's work session. And I don't want to discuss the, the details now, I'll leave that to staff but I want to encourage you to pay close attention to how voters responded to a bond measure that includes higher levels of funding for bicycling, pedestrian facilities, and safety projects. You might ask, why should the city invest more bond revenue in active transportation? Well, first, bond funds have been used to leverage millions of dollars in state and federal funds to complete active transportation projects that couldn't be completed with outside revenue sources. So we don't want to be leaving millions of dollars on the table. And second, the active transportation network, it is, just isn't complete. And we can't expect a lot more people to walk and bike until it's complete any more than we could expect people to use other incomplete networks. You know, to, just to put this in perspective, imagine that we had a freeway system without the I-5 bridge over the Willamette River. Or uh, imagine a freight network where there are a few miles of dirt roads or a railroad system with a few miles of missing track. 
Now that puts it in perspective. Ruth Bascom envisioned a citywide bicycle network in 1972, and she documented it in a 10 minute film that's available online. And I'll send you that. It's really worth a watch. It's fun to watch and you'll learn a lot. 50 years later though, the network is still far from complete. By increasing the allocation of bond revenue for active transportation, the city will be on a path towards completing the network by 2035, the year that the council has targeted for tripling the number of trips made by foot, bike, and bus. If you want a bond measure that voters are mo most likely to support and is consistent with the, uh, the policies you've established, I encourage highest level of funding for active transportation. Thank you, Alan. Next is Justin Sandoval, followed by Jacob True. Mayor Venice, city council members, thank you for this opportunity to give testimony. My name is Justin Sandoval and I live in uh, Ward 1. I urge you to let voters help achieve our community climate and safety equity goals by approving a street repair bond measure that dedicates a significantly larger portion of revenue to active transportation projects that has occurred within the previous bond measures. I serve on the Active Transportation Committee, and while the committee hasn't had an opportunity to receive the polling results and discuss the most recent staff recommendations, in January, the ATC unanimously approved a letter expressing support of a bond measure sufficient to support completion of the active transportation projects in the TSP plan by 2035. Look, completely these projects is critical if we hope to move the needle beyond the small percentage of trips currently made by foot or by bike. For the average Eugene resident who currently drives a car and even for very short trips, we need more than striped bike lanes that we've used in the past. Projects like Protected Bikeway on East Amazon, which provide a safe and comfortable place for bicycling and have been proven to increase the number of people who ride bikes, including families and children, inexperienced bicyclists, and maybe even folks like you. The Amazon corridor and many other essential transportation projects have been built with a combination of bond measures funds along with the state and federal grants. The key to their completion is the bond measure funds can be used as local match to obtain grants and then enable the city to build projects that would otherwise be very difficult to fund exclusively with just local revenue. The bond measure lets us get more money for our money, gets much more money uh, by leveraging grants for active transportation. While fixing potholes and repaving streets is important, these projects are unlikely to be eligible for grant funding. Active transportation projects, in contrast, are often eligible for state and federal funding, but typically require a local match. Eugene voters like the, like the new active transportation projects, and they really like getting them without having to pay an entire cost. As you consider possible measure uh, proposals, please choose the option that gets us the most bang for the buck by funding active transportation. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for working for the community. Thank you, Justin. Next is Jacob True, and he appears to have dropped out of the Zoom meeting. So we will move to Steve Bade, followed by Aya Cockrum. Hi, this is Steve Bade. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I'm here, I, I live in Ward 1, and I'm here to talk about the pavement bond measure that will come before council. Look, Eugene's transportation system for automobiles is basically complete. People complete. People with cars can get anywhere in town easily and fairly safely, even with potholes. The network for walking and rolling is still far from complete. Many destinations in Eugene are not safely reachable by transit, on foot, by bicycle, or scooter or using a mobility device. Kids and adults who don't drive due to their age and or health, due to the expense, the moral imperative, these are our citizens most affected by the lack of investment in walking and bike bicycling infrastructure. The projects and expenses need to be equitable. Please allocate at least 30% of any bond monies to active transportation. And the expense will support Eugene's transportation systems plan and climate action plan, which are intended to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in this city by tripling active transportation mode share by 2035. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Steve. Next is Aya Cockrum, followed by Jacob True.
me just one moment as Aya has moved over to a panelist. Aya, please unmute. Aya, please unmute. Aya, please unmute. Okay, Aya is trying to unmute, so we will go ahead and move to Jacob True. Hello. Uh, my name is Jacob True. I'm a resident of Ward 1 and a proud member of the Eugene Springfield Democratic Socialists of America. We'll speak more on the budget later, but I wanted to ask the entire City Council an honest question. What are you here for? Are you here to enrich yourself, shield the rich and powerful, or protect the voiceless and the oppressed? Rhetoric is all well and good, but your actions are what matter. There are many issues on which you can act clearly and decisively to improve the lives of the working class. Most of the people who live in Eugene rent. They're crying out against the landlords to provide substandard places to live and charge outrageous application fees and play shameful games with security deposits. The rental protections before you now are the very least you can do. We have many neighbors forced to live on the streets due to inadequate housing opportunities. The city is spending, on millions, spending millions on safe sleep shelters. How about housing them instead? Vacancy taxes, Airbnb restrictions, and land trips land trusts are options that the city council hasn't yet investigated. As many folks before me have stated, climate change is already here. We need dense, low-income, electrified housing, preferably state-owned and operated. Requiring new construction to be electrified, not pumping in methane, is the bare minimum. After that basic first step, we, can, uh, we need a plan to equitably electrify our current housing stock. I can personally attest that changing our system from a methane furnace to a heat pump has caused us to save significantly on overall monthly bills. I've been closely watching the city council and I've seen how basic necessities and protections for the working class are slowed by procedural games at the city council. The requests from developers and capitalists are allowed with, by, with a quick discussion and fast vote, not months and months of circular discussions. The working class of Eugene is slow rolled while businesses and capitalist requests are fast tracked. City council has genuine power to directly affect the lives of those that live in our community. Use it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Aya, can you unmute? Good job. That was, that was really good. Yeah, it was, uh, we will move back to Kathy yeah, Ging. Yeah, I think you could have you talked a little bit more slowly, but I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, he did a pretty good job, even though I didn't like yeah. Kathy, please unmute. OK, I'm here. OK. Um, Spotlight uh, on America. KVAL Sunday discussed EV fire problems. Dangerous, they can require 10 times more water to extinguish. One required 10,000 gallons besides spreading toxins to firefighters, many untrained. Take a circumferential look at EVs before you're doing a complete new turn. David Bloom, alcohol can be a gas, said we won't be able to transition 100% to EVs. All grids are unable to stand loads. Hybrids will be needed, liquid fuels and batteries. Plus, hundreds of new nuclear power plants would be needed if you saw the Register Guard article recently. Hemp stocks, however, can be turned into gas. I sent an email to you how hemp gas could cost $1.46 if enough grown. In search, in search engine put, hemp ethanol could replace gas costs four times less a pump. Um, second, I was asked about what Liberated Salad is. Uh, LiberatedSalad.com is an essay, not a business. A one hour a week organic oasis urban victory for garden wannabes with minimal time, pale green thumb, little space. Liberated Salad is a flamboyant salad bouquet any can grow. A, bon a bountiful mini garden for busy folks, senior, better abled that may not buy a fridge of greens or 100 different seeds to plant a little piece in a little space, yet love to eat fresh, healthy, vibrant greens. It is a gesture toward mental health in a troubled world, too. Liberated salad is 40 to 100 different seeds mixed in a bowl, packaged in small jewelry bags. I gave away 4,000 packages to people from 150 countries in the last 35 years. This salad can grow maximally west of the Cascade with no protective coverings. I just it is twice liberated. 
liberate you from a gardener with hands dirty, brow sweaty, back sore. You liberate pale, bland lettuce salad, lifeless square tomato to nutritious greens, purples, and reds. Eat the outer leaves and let the inner grow. It's not all consumed in one picking. Also see GardenTowerProject.com, a vertical garden technique that uses recycled plastic, but it could be made of hempcrete. Biodiversity at the table is on the marble outside Old Courthouse between Mother Teresa and Wayne Morris blocks. Also at the thank UC you, Library Kathy. Your time has concluded. Next, we will hear from Tomoko Sekiguchi, followed by William Smith. Good evening, Mayor Venice, City Council, and City Manager Maderi. Thank you for this opportunity for testimony. My name is Tomoko Sekiguchi, and I'm a resident of Eugene in Ward 3. We need to stop using precious fossil fuels in frivolous ways that we have been doing. We, we have become so accustomed to this extravagance, that it ha but it has to stop. This is not an easy thing to do, and so we need our government leaders to help us rein in these habits. I have been watching and working for progress on the climate recovery ordinances promise to keep its goal to reduce community, um, community fossil fuel use by 50% of 20, 2010 levels by 2030. And in the 12 years that I have been had my eye on the, on the progression, it feels like we are finally very close to making a, um, making a significant move toward honoring that promise by passing an ordinance that will transition us away from methane gas. And methane or frac gas is one of the top three most problematic greenhouse gases that is destroying the livability of the planet. Progress has been far too slow, and we are now at the last half of the last minute for making changes and pushing the stone over the top of this incline and making this necessary change will have a definite effect in reducing greenhouse gases. It is crucial for the climate flight and, dire and, it, and directly relates to lowering global tem temperature, um, temperature and stopping methane ga gas in new buildings is a necessary first step. We will send a clear message and others will follow. We have been hearing about the need for change long enough and the call has become so intense that when, when you ratify this ordinance, there will be public approval. How long can we bemoan the current state of things and not, not take appropriate action? The time is now, which means ending new methane gas permits and shifting to electrification in 2023. I'm sure you've heard it said that our house is on fire. Let's stop throwing gas on it. Thank you. Thank you, Tomoko. Next is William Smith, followed by Joshua Kern. William Smith, Ward 1 here to talk about wireless safety. And first I'd like to acknowledge the people who would be here, but are not because of the microwave radiation in this room. And I have a meter to demonstrate this. Showing high, high microwave radiation in this room that we're all exposed to. Only about 10% of the population um, has real issues with this and are aware of it. Uh, according to Doc Talkover, we are the evidence. There are many more who not, are not yet aware of it. Um, so that's all on that. And now I'd like to talk about robust discussion. I um, realize that you've been advised uh, to not talk about this issue, at least not publicly, um, that your hands are tied. Uh, I'd like to highlight the Constitution, uh, the First Amendment, robust discussion, especially public discussion, and when it gets hard. When it's easy, the First Amendment, that's nice, but when it gets hard, when people are feeling vulnerable, like the founders of this country, when they sign their name, 56 of them, and risk their lives for the sake of robust discussion, 
that's what I'm interested in, especially with this issue. And so uh, I realize, um, given that y'all feel your hands are tied and um, can't talk about it, although other cities don't quite agree with this, but anyway, I'll try to do my part to um, forward some robust discussion here. So if I imagine myself in your shoes uh, as an elected representative of people like me, um, I, and also my experience in business with IBM and, uh, and with a nonprofit, an international nonprofit, I look at a decision, uh, a potential decision to make. Either we continue uh, with business as usual or we uh, take a different route. And with business as usual, the positives are you get to honor the FCC executive order from back in 2018, and um, which was actually vacated. Uh, and then on the, uh, uh, and also you get to honor the FCC guidelines. Thank you, William. Your time has concluded. Next is Joshua Kern, followed by Aya Cochran. Aya will be our last speaker. Joshua Korn, uh, Ward 2. And since the last uh, council meeting, uh, the FDA has uh, given emergency use authorization to two COVID vaccine products for um, ages six months to uh, six years of age um, for children based on a study uh, one of the studies was um, was actually um, supposed to include the results of 4,500 children in three age groups. It uh, was actually decided based on 12 children, 12 children. And you should really look at that study if you want to really understand um, real science because um, it's being neglected. It's being neglected in this subject and getting back to the children and um, wireless radiation. Um, I, last time I mentioned this Environmental Health Trust review of the Senate Bill 283 and the problems associated with it, which they reviewed in, in here, um, it documents the flaws and deficiencies of the OHA report, which include uh, no publication or public con consultation or scope review protocols, emission of animal and in vitro research on radio frequency radiation, emission of reference to the classification of uh, radio frequency radiation as a class 2B carcinogen by the WHO, and, um, and the omission of research on children's unique vulnerability to RFR, a mission of research characterizing school exposures to the multitude of RFR sources students are exposed to in the classrooms, including Wi-Fi routers, wireless devices, cell phones, and cell towers. Uh, it, it also um, points out OHA's uh, omission of laboratory animal studies in Contrary to the scientific consensus on methods to identify a hazard, um, world's leading public health agencies all consider animal research, including the U.S. National Toxicology Program. Thank you, Joshua. Your time has concluded. Next is Aya Cockrum, our final speaker for the night. Hello, uh, Mayor Venice, City Councilors, and City Manager Maderi. I want to to say that I appreciate your time tonight and the opportunity to give testimony and also thank you, Naya, for stay, bearing with me as I um, navigated my issues giving testimony tonight. Um, it is, we are in our first heat dome and my daughter was having trouble going to sleep. I usually get her to sleep before these testimonies, but was not able to tonight, even with air conditioning. Um, so my name is Aya Cockrum. I reside in Ward 1. I'm a Eugene native mother and the Fossil Free Eugene Coalition coordinator. And as you may have guessed from my job description, I would like to urge you tonight to direct staff to draft an electrification ordinance at your July 25th work session and that you expedite the passage of this ordinance as much as possible, voting to mandate new buildings be all electric in 2023, no later than September 20, uh, 26th, Count City Council meeting. 
Um, I also wanted to urge all of you to attend the Fossil Free Eugene Electrification Ordinance webinar, which at which we will have a panel of lawyers to discuss the implementation and Eugene's legal authority to implement such an ordinance. I think it will be really informative and answer a lot of questions folks may have. So I will make sure you all get invitations and I hope you can be there. But today I want to talk to you about another important step we need to take to move away from fossil fuels. The priority, priority must be given to active transportation. Before I could ride my bike, my parents pushed me to school on their bike seats. When I could ride, I rode. It took me until the age of 30 when it became necessary for work for me to get my license. For me, bicycling is a way of life. It is my exercise transportation. It is how I live my climate values and something I love. It is something um, I want to pass on to my daughter, but I also want to keep her safe. In my three decades as an exclusive bike commuter, I was only hit by a car once in Eugene, but ride, riding my bike home from South Eugene High School, but I have had countless close calls. We need to do this for our climate future, for the safety of our citizens, and so I ask you to de dedicate a full 30% of bond funds to active transportation. I hope the City Council will continue to prioritize the movement away from fossil fuels through supporting active transportation and building electrification. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great evening. Thank you, Aya. Aya was our last speaker for forum. Thank you very much, everyone who took the time to uh, speak to us tonight on a, on a wide variety of topics, and we really appreciate you taking the time and appreciate managing difficult connections and children who haven't gone to sleep and all of the other challenges that we face trying to do more than one thing at a time. So uh, thank you all. Are there counselors with comments or questions on anything you've heard? I do, uh, I do want to turn to the city manager to address, a, a, give us a little bit of an information about 5G. Thank you, Mayor. I was hoping I could do that before William and Joshua left the building. Uh, the last time I think we were here doing a work session with council and we gave kind of an update on where we were at, council set some new kind of direction around distance. She wanted us to consider around residences, aesthetic placement of, of those small cell towers. We also made a commitment that we would return to you if we heard of anybody coming in for a permit for 5G. So as you might recall, we permit all of those installations in the public right of way. Uh, in cases where there's a land use conflict, we, we also get involved in private property. There's probably places on private property where it could be installed and wouldn't need a land use, I think. I'm not 100% sure that I wouldn't know about. But since the time we've been here, we haven't had any. We haven't had any land use applications to look at that. We haven't had any um, permit applications with our public works department. And they would need that whether they were installing just a 5G small cell or if they were taking an existing 4G that's capable of 5G, they can't switch it over or renovate it without a permit either. So to this date, we don't have any 5G that none, nothing has changed since the last time we were here. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that because it was starting to feel like a lot was popping up around town. Thank you very much for that clarification. I appreciate that. And um, so with that, I think we're complete with the public forum and uh, ready to move on to um, our public hearing and action first on the FY, FY22 supplemental budget. This is a public hearing on a resolution adopting resolu uh, hmm. This is a public hearing on a resolution adopting a supplemental budget, making appropriations for the city of Eugene for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2021, and ending June 30th, 2022. And I don't know that we need an introduction of this topic, uh, in particular, unless someone so. Are, are there people signed up to speak? We have one person signed up to speak, John <laughs> Borofsky. Yay. Oh, so I should formally open this public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, my testimony is a little bit out of order today because I didn't think supplemental budget would be the first one. So I'm going to be addressing a few things that I would have addressed later. Before you this evening is approval of supplemental budget two. This supplemental budget is recognizing unforeseen revenue or expenditures 
that will go to support and enhance many council and community goals and priorities. With that, I hope you approve SB2. I would like to use the rest of my time to address an ongoing issue with the city's budget. Over the years, the community and through you as the city council has enacted several plans and policies that are important to your constituents and our community as a whole. Plans like the Climate Action Plan, CAP 2.0, Vision Zero, the Housing Implementation Pipeline, as well as the Transportation System Plan are all well thought out and developed policies, except for when it comes to funding. Many of the plans have limited or no funding identified. In the future, I would hope that when you look at new or existing policies, you also look at the budgetary impacts of the policies and how to fund it. With regards to the previous mentioned plans, may I make a suggestion? As, a, as you are aware, the city chartered utility partner, eWeb, contributes 6% of its ratepayers' revenues to the city in the form of contribution in lieu of taxes or SILT. I would urge you to work with your eWeb partners to dedicate part of that money towards energy efficiencies for rental properties. That, those properties as of now have little incentive to increase. This would help with the community's greenhouse gas emissions, the CAP 2.0, as well as adding to the affordability of the rental housing, which is identified in the housing implementation pipeline. I hope as a council that you will consider, consider asking the city manager and staff to work with your partners at eWeb to investigate options going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our only testimony. That was my only speaker signed up for that topic. Okay. Uh, so I think, are there any questions or comments from council? Uh, Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, thanks for that testimony, John. Um, city manager, all of the SIL contribution in lieu of taxes goes into the general fund. Is that correct? Yes. So, if it all goes into the general fund and we rededicate a portion of it towards um, weatherizing rental homes or making them more energy efficient, uh, that means we'd have to cut something else out of the general fund, which um, would be an interesting conversation to have, but I doubt it would go very far um, since the general fund is pretty limited in the first place and it, and it has been subject to a lot of cuts and will continue to be. Uh, but if eWeb wanted to increase the silt to uh, pay for a, a rental weatherization program so the city could uh, operate it and, and help people weatherize or make their rental properties more energy efficient, I think that would be a really um, interesting conversation. Otherwise, I fear that uh, we're in the zero-sum game for the general fund. Thanks, Mayor. Questions or comments? Okay, I think uh, council president, I'm ready for a motion. Move to adopt a resolution adopting a supplemental budget making appropriations for the city of Eugene for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2021 and ending June 30, 2022. Second. Okay, there's no further questions or discussion. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So that, um, I, I don't think I gavel out, but I'm gaveling back in. I'm about to open the second public hearing and action. This is a public hearing on a resolution adopting the budget, making appropriations, determining, levying, and categorizing the annual ad valorem property tax levy for the city of Eugene for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022 and ending June 30, 2023. A resolution electing to receive state revenue sharing funds pursuant to section 221.770 of Oregon revised statutes and a resolution certifying that the city of Eugene provides the municipal services required by Oregon revised statutes section 221.760 in order to receive state shared revenues. 
And again, uh, with that, I will open the public hearing and turn it over to staff. We have six people signed up to speak that will be called in order that is appearing on the screen. For those of you who signed up to comment on this topic, you will have three minutes to comment. A timer will be available on screen to indicate the time that you have to speak and the red light does indicate the end of those three minutes. So first will be Luke Bernard followed by Ethan Klein. Luke, please unmute. Hello, City Council, another Eugene elected. Uh, my name is Luke Barnard and I live in Eugene Ward 7. Um, and I'm a member of the Eugene Springfield Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I'd like to start my testimony uh, with a recent quote from Councillor Alan Zelenka from a June 22nd Register Guard article discussing safe sleep sites. Uh, quote, this is expensive stuff to do, and we don't have enough funding to do it all. And more importantly, we don't have a dedicated source of ongoing, dedicated funding that we really need to make it sustainable, unquote. Uh, the article goes on to mention a price tag for development and operational costs uh, through July 1st, 2024 for these safe sleep sites at about $8.1 million. Um, these safe sleep sites are controversial um, from both those who uh, support the houseless community and those who are actively hostile against our houseless neighbors. Um, but I think, I, I, or I, I bring this up to illustrate um, the kind of funding power that I believe the city council has. Um, I think that the proposed increase to the Eugene Police Department of $10 million uh, put forward in the fiscal year 2023 budget um, to be immoral and um, financially a mistake. Um, I think that should be redirected to desperately needed uh, social programs and wraparound services like these safe sleep sites provide. Um, maybe it's not these things that you choose to fund with that money, but um, there are many, many other um, things that certainly could be used for that in that same vein. Uh, thank you for your time. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Luke. Next is Ethan Klein, followed by John Borofsky. Is this a uh, testimony for the adoption of the FY23 budget? Okay, didn't know if I misheard. Uh, so my name's Ethan Klein again. I'm from uh, Eugene uh, Ward 1. I'm here uh, representing the Eugene Springfield Democratic Socialists of America in my public testimony. Uh, I'll also add that I am currently uh, working as a case manager for senior and disability services, although any statements I make does not reflect uh, my employer or uh, my views in that, in that line of work. Um, I just want to comment uh, that I too disagree that the Eugene Police Department should be getting any more money, specifically a $10 million uh, increase in their current funding when uh, our very own uh, Homegrown Cahoots program uh, takes a uh, conservative estimate of 20% of uh, EPD's calls, why uh, Cahoots and uh, White Bird is not earmarked to get approximately 20% of the $10 million. I don't know why that, that's not being voted on. Um, and uh, to, to speak to Chief Skinner's points at the, um, get, when he was giving comments at the Wayne Morris Center a uh, number of weeks ago, I mean, he even said so himself that social services, wrapped around services, houselessness services, all these services, um, are currently underfunded right now. And as a result, they are underperforming. Um, it doesn't take uh, rocket scientists to understand that when services are underfunded, that they un vastly underperform. Um, and I just also want to add that, um, yeah, that's, that's, basically, that's basically it. Please do not <laughs> adopt this FY23 budget. I implore you 
uh, please consider uh, funding other services be, besides giving the police department more money. They certainly do not need it. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Ethan. Next is John Borofsky, followed by Jacob True. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thanks for the opportunity to comment on the City of Eugene's proposed budget for 2023. I would like to express my gratitude to the City Council, Budget Committee, and City staff for the time and energy that went into developing this budget. I'm excited by the new and comprehensive approach the City Manager is taking with the new budget process. The past few years have been challenging for all of us in this community. And developing a budget in these times has also proven to be challenging. We have been fortunate to receive federal relief or financial relief from the federal government. And this has been essential in maintaining and enhancing many city priorities and funds. This budget includes items that will help fund several of the council's priorities. Some of these are a climate analysis to work on the city's cap 2.0 policy an unhoused response position, as well as $125,000 to the Human Services Commission to help with the escalating wage constraints on our nonprofits. This, is, this also represents the first year that the Community Safety Initiative is fully funded and able to implement the strategies put forward by you, the council. There is one detail that I would like to bring to your, bring up, and that is the fact that we are deviating from a council approved budgetary policy. This is policy number B7, which has to do with the unappropriated ending fund balance or the UEFB. That policy states that the UEFB shall be at least two months of operating expenses. This will be the first time that the UEFB will be less than two months operating expenses. This has been explained by staff that it has to do with COVID relief money and the calculations that that entails. I don't see any problems with this. I just wanted to bring it up so that you as a council are aware that the budget you're approving deviates from adopted budgetary policies set by you as a council. I fully support and approve the budget and hope that you will approve it this evening. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next is Jacob True followed by Kevin Cronin. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jacob True, and I'm in Ward 1, Emily Simple's Ward. I'm here to discuss the budget. Um, it, along with uh, other representatives from uh, other members of the Eugene DSA, I am disappointed in the budget as it, uh, as it is stands right now, um, with uh, $10 million uh, additional to the police, paid for uh, mostly by a payroll tax, um, on um, uh, the workers here in Eugene. Um, I believe that's a poor use of funds. Right now, the, uh, just, just a few days ago, the Eugene police, or more specifically the Springfield police, brought over um, um, uh, to the community uh, at, a, at a peaceful protest, um, uh, arrested and uh, fractured uh, bones of several protesters. Um, and um, as, as it was done by the Springfield SPD, um, those aren't covered under the uh, protections that we've uh, set in place here in Eugene. Um, this is disappointing. I don't understand why we're wanting to bring in $10 million or 20% uh, increase to their budget this year um, to a police department that um, you know um, treats its citizens in that manner. I only I expect that things will continue to go this way, um, uh, when when we could, uh, we have the nationally recognized Cahoots program or the uh, uh, the crisis response team up in Portland uh, that is doing fantastic work and would be a good use of funds as opposed to just giving more money to the police, um, just sweeping yeah you know, using the police to sweep the homeless off the street isn't a solution. What we could be using that money for is housing the homeless. Um, if the folks have a problem. And that is, if they're living on the streets, they don't have a home. How about they? Uh, how about we give them uh, some low-income housing, so they can get their lives in order? And you know, like, it, it doesn't seem like that difficult of a proposition to me. 
just uh, funding police to shove people around doesn't isn't a good use of funds, isn't a, a good stewardship. I recognize that um, the budget committee um, tried uh, in their last meeting to uh, get more funds allocated to stabilizing cahoots, but um, all of the city council members um, voted against it, so it didn't pass. Um, I understand that the citizen members of the budget committee are dedicated to supporting cahoots and crisis response uh, uh, on the streets of Eugene, and I'd like to ask the city council why they oppose funding cahoots to the extent necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Next is Kevin Cronin, followed by our final speaker, Fatima Hersey. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kevin. I live in Ward 8 and I came tonight with Eugene DSA. Um, we're in the middle of a recession and my family has been asked to make do with the same amount of money. And so I came to speak against the police budget. Um, increasing police funding by $10 million is excessive. Eugene police routinely squanders their resources in a way that no other city department could get away with. And I'm about to cover some examples. So on April 24th, the Register Guard reported that police dedicated overtime to 10 officers and sergeants to come break up a college party at 3.30 in the afternoon. On May 9th, the Register Guard reported Eugene police calling for backup from Springfield and Lane County to bust up a party. Um, I believe it was before the noise ordinance takes effect. On May 13th, um, the Register Guard again reports excessive police presence in response to drinking in West University neighborhood. I've lived in West University neighborhood and know it well, um, but uh, except, you know that's something that happens there, drinking. Uh, my understanding is that when uh, Eugene police requests assistance from say Lane County, Junction City, Springfield PD, they get a bill for the cost to respond to that. So this past weekend, EPD asked Springfield PD to respond to First Amendment activity um, in the crowd and what I believe to be excessive use of force. Um, so when Springfield got there, the tension in the crowd increased and uh, we saw some excessive use of force. Incidents um, like, like what I'm describing uh, show up in tonight's work session packet with the Civilian Review Board. Um, you can look in there. They show up as dismissed outside jurisdiction. So look for those and you can see which, uh, which incidents are like outside police responding. So if our budget is gonna pay for this, these officers need to be subject to our civilian review board. And so I don't know what sort of contract needs to be worked out, but like that needs to happen and happen really quick. Um, so please ask the police to do better with what they got, just like you're asking my family to do as well. Um, and so please vote no on this budget. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin. And our final speaker, Fatima Hersey, appears to have left the Zoom meeting. So that concludes our speakers. Okay, thank you. I closed the public hearing and uh, are there open it for counselors? Are there any questions or comments on anything you've heard? Okay, not seeing none. I will turn to the council president. Move to approve a resolution electing to receive state revenue sharing funds pursuant to section 221.770 of Oregon revised statutes. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. And next one. Move to approve a resolution certifying that the city of Eugene provides the municipal services required by Oregon Revised Statutes, section 221.760. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That passes. Thank you. And one more. Move to approve a resolution adopting the budget, making appropriations, and determining, levying, and categorizing the annual ad valorem property tax levy for the city of Eugene for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022, and ending June 30, 2023. Second. 
All in favor, please raise your hands. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And I now adjourn the meeting of Eugene City Council and convene a meeting of the Eugene Urban Renewal Agency for our next public hearing. This is a public hearing on a resolution of the Urban Renewal Agency of the City of Eugene adopting the budget, making appropriations, and declaring the amount of tax to be certified for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022, and ending June 30, 2023. And again, I now open the public hearing and turn it over to staff. We have one speaker that has signed up um, to speak to this topic. Um, for the one of you that signed up, you will have three minutes to comment and the timer will, will show you how much time you have left. The yellow light indicates you have 15 seconds. The red light indicates your time has concluded. Welcome, John Borofsky. <laughs> it's different this time. Agency president and directors. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the City of Eugene's Urban Renewal Agency budget. As you're aware, over the past few years, the two agencies have a, had a great amount of influence in revitalizing some of the city's beloved spaces. We've seen a f the new farmer's market, as well as the development along the riverfront with the grand opening of one of the city's newest parks. We've also been able to put into works the read of revitalization of the 1059 Willamette building to transform it into much needed downtown housing. At a, at a recent work session, staff brought you a presentation on the status of the urban renewal districts with the question of whether to extend, amend, or let the urban renewal districts expire. I believe that if you look at this budget, you will see much of the good that those two urban renewal agencies have provided to the community. Another thing that I will hope you will consider is the amount of funding that planning and development department receives from these agencies. In this budget alone, planning and development received over $1.3 million. If the agencies go away, the resources that are being allocated for planning in these areas will need to be reduced or find some other form of funding to continue the work. As you are aware, much of the planning department budget involves staff. So a major reduction in budget could result in the loss of staff positions. I would recommend the approval of the Urban Renewal Agency's budget for FY23. Thank you for this opportunity to give input on this budget. And with my last minute, <clears throat> I'll just say a few things off the cuff. One. I, I really like the new budget format, but I missed the book. So I didn't get, I didn't get my, my budget document this year. It was all virtual and I saved a few trees. Um, <clears throat> and the second thing, um, Councillor Zelenka gave uh, mention to the fact that EWEB possibly could in, increase their silt. Well, every time that the Eugene Water and Electric Board rates their rates, which they haven't done in the last five years, it's an automatic increase to the general fund. This year, we're planning on raising rates about 3%. That equates to almost $300,000 more that is gonna be going to the general fund. So that could be a percentage of the money that could help with energy efficiency for our low income and rental housing stock. That's what I'm talking about when working with your partners in the other agencies. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. I now close the public hearing and open it. Uh, are there any comments from, yes, Councilor Sarant. Yeah, uh, just in response to that, uh, on the increase that uh, EWEB anticipates for their silt, the city manager and our finance staff has already built that increase into our projections. So it's not considered extra on top of what we normally would get. But I appreciate the thoughtfulness around trying to figure out how we do find some dedicated funding for those purposes. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Councilor Gross. Thank you, Mayor. I, I too want to echo my appreciation for trying to innovate 
and look at different ways of, of funding um, needs that we have in our, our community. And we know that we have a, a dearth of affordable housing here that we need to, we need, we just need more housing. And so I think anything that uh, moves us in that direction um, uh, is certainly appreciated. I know this is about energy efficiency, but that's part of the whole package. Um, trying to have places where people can dwell that are affordable. And this is a way of, of getting there. So thank you for at least thinking uh, outside the box. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, I was gonna say what Claire said that it's already built into the budget and, and, and because of that, it would still require us to reallocate and then cut something out of the general fund because uh, silt is built in to cover costs of increases for colas and things like that. Um, and, and this issue of rental weatherization is actually, <laughs> not a new issue. It's a perennial issue that's been going on for literally decades. Um, the very first project I ever worked on in the energy space in the early 1990s when I was in graduate school at the University of Oregon was uh, a project for eWeb on rental weatherization and how to sure that they get funded so that they become more energy efficient. So this, pro this problem has been around for a very long time. We've yet to crack the nut, but we've made a lot of headway in, in weatherizing uh, rental properties. There's, there's some built-in disincentives because the person using the energy isn't the person who owns the house and maybe not even paying the utility bills. So there's a lot of uh, interesting problems that need to overcome, but uh, thanks for keeping your thinking cap on, John. Thank you. Uh, so I will turn this over to the agency director. <laughs> Move to approve a resolution of the Urban Renewal Agency of the City of Eugene adopting the budget, making appropriations, and declaring the amount of tax to be certified for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022, and ending June 30, 2023. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that passes unanimously. Thank you. I now adjourn the meeting of the Eugene Urban Renewal Agency and reconvene a meeting of the Eugene City Council, or convene, I guess, I shouldn't say reconvene, um, for this final action, uh, Public Contracting Provisions and Exceptions, EC 2.1400 to 2.1451. Manager, do you need to explain this in any way? Um, I can't, I would just be reading the issue statement. So if you want me to do that, I can. I, is it all clear to, are you all clear on this? I think, I think it's not necessary. All right, uh, council president. Move to adopt the ordinance concerning public contracting. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thank you to those of you who stayed and um, st were here in person. It was nice to have people in the room. And with that, we are adjourned.